Thank you. You may be seated. Now, you know, sometimes you hear me complain about how they've changed the words to hymns or left out verses to hymns. And uh, But sometimes somebody had some theological acumen and changed the hymn in the correct manner. I don't know if you caught it on the last verse of it here in this celebration hymnal, but it has been changed from an amillennial hymn to a premillennial hymn. <laughs> come round the time of gold, and in here it says, shall come the time foretold. <laughs> Very good. Good job, whoever did that. All right, take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the um, book of Exodus, where we are studying and looking at the Jews as God's people is the church Israel. The Jews as God's people is the church Israel. And as you know, we have spent three weeks on this. I'd actually hoped to finish it in one sermon, but it didn't work out that way. Uh, there's just too much here because we have to answer too many questions by people who in many in covenant circles, many in even Presbyterian circles, believe that Israel is the church and that the church is Israel. And as we are looking at Exodus chapter 6, we noted that eight different times God says, I will do this for you and I will take you to me for a people. You belong to me. A very special relationship that God has with national Israel. Clearly national Israel in the context of Exodus chapter 6. He's calling the Jews out of Egypt to make them into his people. You recall that in our study of the covenant of the land, we saw extensive biblical support for a promised future for a literal national Israel from the Bible. We emphasize that the final touchstone is the scripture, not what developed in the course of political or theological history. We began our study of the question, is the church Israel, by starting to look at all the references to the term Israel in the New Testament. And most of those references, as you know, are in the writings of the Apostle Paul. We began with Romans chapter 9, verse 6, which is one of the passages that replacement theologians like to pull out of its context to try to prove that Israel is the church. Verse 6 says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. But we notice that it did not say that the church is Israel in that passage, or Israel is the church. It merely excluded unbelieving Jews from those who are the true Israel of God. And that's Paul's argument throughout the entire ninth chapter. And so we learned a very important principle of interpreting scripture, which is, don't take a text out of context as a proof text. Make sure that the text that you are looking at is being understood the way the author intended it to be understood by looking at the entire context. We looked at the context of Romans 9 and the first five verses that precede verse 6 are clearly referring to national Israel. Replacement theologians rip them out of that context. Paul is talking about real Jews when he uses the term Israel. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, that's real Jews, who are Israelites, that's real Jews, to whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law, that's real Jews, and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, he came through a real Jewish line. Abraham, all the way down to David, all the way down to our Lord Jesus Christ, and his genealogies, both his father or his stepfather and his mother are given to us in Matthew and Luke. That does not make the church Israel, nor Israel the church. Instead, it excludes the non-believing Jews and all non-believing physical descendants of Abraham through all the other women other than Sarah. That's an essential point in the context of Romans 9. That brought us to the second key principle that the replacement theologians tend to ignore in the passage, and that is the remnant principle. God always, always, without exception, always reserves to himself a remnant of believers no matter how bad the rest of the world has become. Romans ends, 9 ends with a conclusion that I just stated. God includes men in his blessings who are men of faith, not merely physical descendants of Abraham through Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve tribes. And to that conclusion, as we noted last week, most replacement theologians would say, Amen. But in the course of the mix, they also say that God no longer has promises for national Israel, which ignores the context of that entire chapter. 
So in that context, when we look at the next chapter, Romans 10, it's clear that Paul was referring to Jews when he uses the term Israel. Verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Very clearly, he's still talking about national Israel. Then we looked at the next chapter, which in context still refers to the Jews, Romans chapter 11. Romans 11, 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people. Remember, that's the promise that we've just been looking at over in the book of Exodus. God said, I'm going to make you my people. Has God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. We're talking still literal, real, national Israel, Jews, when we get to Romans 11. So chapter 9, literal Jews. Chapter 10, literal Jews. Chapter 11, literal Jews. Then down in verse 5, God uses the Jewish people to prove the point that he always saves the remnant. Remember, we just discussed that. That's part of Romans chapter 10. Even in our time, no matter how bad things are getting in the world around us. Verse 5 says, even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. You know, God does what he wants to do in history. <laughs> a lot of people don't like to admit that. They think things happen by accident. They think that man is in control. But God is in control. And God has an ele election of grace whereby he has chosen a certain remnant. And remember the context. It's Jews in Romans 9, Romans 10, Romans chapter 11. There is still a remnant according to the principle of God's extended grace. Not because they deserve it. Just like you and I don't deserve it. But there is a remnant according to grace, even in this present time. That brought us to Paul's argument how the sovereign plan of God to allow the nation of Israel to come under judgment was actually a blessing to us as Gentiles, because that meant that God could now open the door for us who had been excluded before. And then Paul states that there is coming a day when the nation of Israel will be brought back into God's blessing. That's down in verse 11. I say then, have they, and here's our contrast, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? There's the remnant principle again. For if the casting away of them but reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So there is a future still for this remnant of Israel. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. The fall is only partial. Paul says so in verse 25. I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Verse 26, there's coming a day when there is going to be a salvation that sweeps across every Jew that is left alive on the face of the earth. We've discussed that in the past. That occurs during the last three days of the Great Tribulation period according to the book of Hosea. But Paul says it, verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's not the church. There is coming a day which is going to reach into every living Jew on the face of the earth who has gone through that great tribulation period, and they're going to realize that Jesus was their Messiah. They're going to cry out to him, and he will return in the clouds of heaven, as prophesied in Scripture. Paul says the Deliverer coming out of Zion. Zion, Zion is Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Dear friends, some exciting things in this passage here. Verse 27, the very next verse, For this is my covenant unto them. Not unto us. This is my covenant unto them. It goes back to Exodus 6, where we're studying right now. This is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. It's not the church. The church is not the enemies of the church. They are enemies for your sakes, but it's touching the election. They are beloved for the Father's sake. God makes unconditional covenants, and he made a bunch of those unconditional covenants to Israel as a nation. Those who are the descendants physically of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the twelve tribes, there will always be a remnant. That's one of his great promises. That's part of his great covenant. And there's coming a day when every Jew left alive on the face of the earth will turn to Christ. Dear people, that's an exciting day. They have to go through a lot before then. But that's an exciting day when they will recognize who their Messiah is. 
That's what Paul's talking about here. In verse 29, and how we love this verse, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. You cannot lose the promise of salvation that God has given to you, nor can the Jews concerning that promise of future restoration that God has given to them. Last week we studied other examples of how Paul uses the term Israel to see if our interpretation of Romans 9 through 11 was consistent with the rest of Scripture, and that gave us the second important principle of Bible interpretation. That is, Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. If something is taught in one passage of Scripture, it will be confirmed elsewhere because the Bible never disagrees with itself. We saw, for example, that Paul says that the Jews, not the church, were the ones who ate of the sacrifices. That's the way he uses the term Israel in 1 Corinthians 10.18. Behold, Israel, after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar. That's the consistent way that Paul uses the term Israel, referring to the Jews. Paul also stated that the Mosaic Law, that is the covenant at Mount Sinai with Israel, was abolished. You're not under the law, you're under grace. Your motivation is not Mount Sinai. Your motivation, if you are a Christian, your motivation is your relationship to Christ through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And sadly, many in Reformed circles today try to put us back under the law because they view Israel as the church. You see, if Israel is the church, that means you're under the covenant of Sinai. You're under the law. But what does the scripture say? 2 Corinthians 3, 7. Here's a key verse that we looked at last week. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious. It was the Ten Commandments that were written and engraven in stones. And Paul calls it the ministration of death. Not the ministration of life, but the ministration of death. It was glorious. In fact, it was so glorious that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. And not as Moses which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. I don't know how you can get any clearer than that. The reason we do what we do today is not because we are being beaten with the whip of the law. It should not be anyway. The reason that we live for Christ today is because we have a love relationship with him. How much different it is for a wife to submit herself, for example, to her husband because she loves him, rather than a Muslim wife, for example, who has to submit herself to her husband because he will beat her or he can say, I divorce you three times and she's out of there. Is there a difference between loving submission of a wife to her husband and the fearful submission of the wife who is afraid for her life? I think there's a difference. I hope you would see there's a difference. Dear people, the reason we live the Christian life is because we have a love relationship with Christ. The reason we are able to live the Christian life is not because we've worked up all of our flesh to do it, but because we are empowered by the Spirit of God. What a different motivation and what a different empowerment for living a life that's filled with joy and peace. A life that's filled with productivity and service. A life that's filled with gladness and thanksgiving. Our relationship to Christ. We saw the contrast between law and grace. John 1.17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that God wasn't gracious in the Old Testament. God is always a God of grace. It doesn't mean that we are antinomian, that there is no uh, structure or standard for the time present. But it's a contrast between what God did in the Old Testament as he was using the law to show us that we were sinners, as he was using the law as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, and now our entrance into that marvelous grace of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. They were looking forward to it back then. We can look back and see that it has been accomplished. God has fulfilled his promise and he has brought us back into fellowship with him. The faith grace principle. We just talked about that a moment ago as contrasted with the law. Therefore it is of faith, is Romans 4.16, that it might be by grace 
faith and grace together to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed not to that only which is of the law that's the national Jews to whom the law was given but that to us also which is of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all why is Abraham set forth so so precisely and over and over again in the New Testament because of his faith you see Abraham is pre-law Abraham is pre-law he's 400 years before the law Abraham wasn't under the law and so it is his faith that is pulled out so that we might understand that what pleases God is faith without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him moreover the law entered that the offense might abound but where sin abounded grace did much more abound the law simply pointed out our sin sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law but under grace if you're under the law sin will have dominion over you if you're under grace God gives you the power not to have sin and have dominion over you what then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace God forbid that doesn't give you the right to sin it merely says yes you're a sinner but God gives grace to overcome the total inability of the law to be the guiding principle of the Christian life Galatians 2 21 I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness come by the law then Christ is dead in vain chapter 5 verse 4 Christ has become no effect unto you whosoever of you are justified by the law ye are fallen from grace they are mutually exclusive folks you cannot be justified by the law and also justified by grace either you think you're justified by the law in which case you're simply condemned you're fooling yourself or you are justified you are declared righteous by the grace of God not because of what you have done then we looked at the second big passage used by replacement theologians what about Israel uh, is, is the Israel of God uh, is Israel the church and uh, that is in Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 we applied the same principles that we saw in Romans chapter 11 the remnant principle and noted that what this passage says it does not say it does not say that Israel is the church Galatians 6 16 as many as walk according to this rule peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God have we talked about a remnant principle are there those who are believing Jews are there those who have the covenants of God applied to them because they are part of that remnant and of course the answer is yes Paul is of course writing to a Gentile church or a group of Gentile churches in the book of Galatians dealing with the heresies of legalism Galatians is dealing with the problem of Judaizers who had come into the churches of Galatia and were teaching that you had to keep the law either to be saved or you had to keep the law in order to be sanctified. Paul is fighting it in Galatians. You can't make a verse in Galatians say the exact opposite of the purpose for which Paul wrote the book. We saw that Paul makes it clear that being Jewish is not what saves you. Uh, every clear passage dealing with Israel equals the Jews we saw that over in Philippians um, chapter 3 verses 4 through 9 I won't read it again we studied it last week and that was brought us to our lesson for today what about the new covenant what is it and how does it apply the new covenant is promised to Israel in Jeremiah chapter 31 beginning in verse 31 and it's an extended passage there I think we probably have time to read it. I didn't write it out in my text, but let's go over to Jeremiah chapter 31 if you've got your Bibles. Um, because there God makes a new covenant with Israel. And so we need to see how does that apply to the church today because the New Testament does mention it. In fact, it deals with it in detail over in the book of Hebrews, which of course was written to Jews, but it's a New Testament book and it also applies to us. Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. Now let's just pause for a minute. He's contrasting the new covenant with what? 
with the covenant that he made with them in the day that he brought them out of Egypt. So, a question that I think even a three-year-old could answer, what was the covenant that God made with them when he brought them out of Egypt? Where was it made? At what mountain? Mount Sinai. Okay, we got it. And the covenant of Mount Sinai was the ten, not the ten suggestions, the ten commandments. Okay. So, God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with them. And you know what? That covenant is one that they broke. Did they ever break any of the Ten Commandments? I mean, he says so here in verse 32, but can you think of any time that Israel ever broke any one of the Ten Commandments? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Over and 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 over every one of them. Not according to the covenant that I made with them, their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law into their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God says, with my new covenant, I'm going to do something that's not external. With my new covenant, I'm going to do something that is internal. Back then I wrote it on rocks. But I'm going to take the finger of God and I'm going to write it in their hearts. Very important. There's going to be a shift between the source and the motivation to this new source and motivation with this new covenant that God makes. I have much to say about that, the Lord willing, in a moment. Verse 34. And they shall teach no man, every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Do you recall anything that we have studied? In fact, I mentioned it just a moment ago. That we have studied where they will all, he's been talking about Israel here, his covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai versus the new covenant he's making with Israel, where it's not written in rocks, it's written in the hearts. And there's not just a remnant of them, but all of them are going to know the Lord. What was the book that I mentioned just a moment ago? Okay, I mentioned Jeremiah, I mentioned, didn't mention Daniel, but I mentioned Hebrews. An Old Testament book begins with an H as five, Hosea. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> the passage which talked about, and I've preached on it over and over again, that every one of the Jews at the end of the tribulation is going to come to the Messiah. Jeremiah is prophesying the same thing. Every one of their hearts is going to be turned to the Lord. Every one of them is going to cry out for him to deliver them. They have no more no more resources of their own to turn to. That day is coming, folks. They have a lot to go through before they get there. But that day is coming. God has promised it. And God says at that point, Israel's going to enter into, as a nation, is going to enter into the new covenant. Now that's very important for us because you and I have some blessings that we've entered into that are part of the new covenant. New Testament says so. Now, You've heard me preach on this, and I'm just going to really summarize it quickly, especially those of you who've been in the evening services. But I've talked about the 17 different mysteries in the New Testament. 17 different things are called a mystery, a mysterion, in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul defines for us what a mystery is. It's not a, you know, a detective story. It's not a scary story. A mystery... Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3 is something that has been revealed unto the apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit that was not revealed in the Old Testament. God has opened up certain new revelation in the New Testament that you don't find in the Old Testament. And one of those is the church. Now folks, that means that when God did this new work, when he brought Gentiles into the family, when he broke down the middle wall of partition, we're going to be looking at those verses in a moment, broke down the middle of partition, wall of partition between the Jews and Gentiles, making one body out of the two of them and forming what is called the church, 
It was a new work that God was doing. And as a result, God has given to us, and I hope you'll see that when we look at the scriptures, God has given to us some of the benefits of this new covenant that someday Israel as a nation, every one of the Jews left alive on the face of the earth, as a nation will enter in to that new covenant as they go into the millennial period. So there you have the promise in the book of Jeremiah. Those are the four key verses that relate to it. Now it's very clear that we have entered into the benefits of the new covenant because God has inscribed these things in our hearts when we're drawn to Christ and the Holy Spirit fills us. You received the indwelling Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. The Holy Spirit does 31 different things at the moment you trust in Christ, but one of those is clearly that he comes inside you to live in you permanently. There's also the sealing of the Spirit. There's also the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which places you in the body of Christ. It's not speaking in tongues. Uh, there are various items that the Holy Spirit does for us that happen at the moment of salvation. One of those is he gives us the benefits of the new covenant. Now, look here at Ephesians chapter 2, if you have your Bibles. I'll start reading in verse 12. No, what it does not say, it does not say the church is Israel, but it does indicate that we've entered into the benefits of the new covenant. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. At that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Do you understand what it's like to be lost? The other night we showed that film, Veil of Tears, about missions to women in India where the suicide rate among women is 20 times greater than any other place in the world. Folks, that's being without hope. When you see that kind of a suicide rate, you know those women as they look at their surroundings, as they look at the horrible way in which they are being treated, they are without hope. Paul says there was a time when we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometime were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You know, Jesus didn't just die for Jews. Aren't you glad? Boy, am I glad. How thankful I am. You've been made nigh, you've been drawn close by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, that is, both Jews and Gentiles. He's writing to Gentiles at Ephesus. And hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, what was the middle wall of partition? He explains it in verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh, that is, Christ in his body on the cross, died for sins. Sin is transgression of the law. And he broke down the wall by doing that. He abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Do you understand the earth-shattering ramifications of the death of Christ? For to make in himself of twain, that is, both the Jews and the Gentiles, one new man, so making peace. Do you get it? When Jesus died, he abolished the enmity. That's the mutual hatred between the Jews and the Gentiles. I mean, you can go through history, and what do you see? Mutual hatred, Jews and Gentiles. I mean, you still got the anti-Semitism today. You saw that in Nazi Germany. You saw that in the Russian pogroms. You see that all over the world, even here in America. He broke down that mutual hatred contained in the law of commandments, the ordinances. And he made something new. He made the church, which is a single unit, a body, composed of both Jews, Gentiles, and those of mixed race. That's what Acts, is, uh, Acts chapter 8 is all about. We find Acts chapter 8, we find two different new groups being brought in. We find one who is born a Gentile, converts to Judaism, and he's a eunuch, so he's neither male nor female. <laughs> we find 
a group in Samaria who are half Jews, half Gentiles, and both men and women are mentioned, whereas in Acts chapter 2 only Jewish males are mentioned, which is the day of Pentecost. You see, the book of Acts is the breaking down of walls. The book of Acts is the spreading of the gospel to the far reaches of the earth. The book of Acts is bringing people in, including people in. The Old Testament was narrowing it down, narrowing it down, narrowing it down, narrowing it down, making a smaller group, making a smaller group, making a smaller group, all the way back from those massive groups before the flood, and we break it and we move it down to a small group, Noah and his family, his wife and his son's wives. And then as the, the world begins to grow again, God breaks it down again, and narrows it down, and narrows it down, and narrows it down until he calls one man, Abraham. And as that begins to grow out and get farther spread out, and Abraham and Sarah have Isaac, but Abraham has other wives. He has Keturah, and he has the concubines, and Hagar, and I mean, a bunch of other... God narrows it down again, narrows it down again, narrows it down again. But now that we're in the New Testament, God is expanding, 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 expanding with the gospel of Christ spreading to the far reaches of the earth. Oh my, I'm glad I live at this time. I'm glad that I wasn't born among the Philistines back in the days of King David. I would have been without hope. So would have you. Well, back to this. So, the Apostle Paul tells us that God is abolishing the enmity of the commandments here. Then he goes on, verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, the cross is what removes all the vicious hatreds that we as people have one for another. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. He just talked about the household of God. You know what? We have now entered the household of God. Not by the covenant of Mount Sinai. That was proselytism. You didn't enter the household of God by the old covenant of Mount Sinai. That's not how you got saved. That's not how you were brought into fellowship with Christ. That's not how you were made one with the Jews in one body and with the Samaritans and with all the others. You were brought nigh by what? Not the law. You were brought nigh by the, the passage told you, the blood of Christ. That's how you were brought close to God. Not because the mountain shook and thundered and fire and smoke and trembling and if a beast so much as touched the mountain you thrust it through with a dart. That's not how you were brought nigh. You were brought nigh by the blood of Christ. What a glorious thought. You're brought into the new covenant built upon the apostles and prophets with Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Verse 19 says that. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens of the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation, not the foundation of Sinai. You are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Folks, the blood of Christ draws you nigh, not the law of Moses. The new covenant as a covenant to Israel is specifically stated in Hebrews chapter 8, and we just read about this in Jeremiah 31. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8 and 10. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Paul, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, yes, I believe that. Uh, Paul, writing Hebrews chapter 8, is quoting Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. That's in the New Testament. That's something we can go to. We don't have to make it up. So how does it fit with what we've just studied that Paul said in Romans, that Paul said in 1 Corinthians, that Paul said in 2 Corinthians, that Paul said in Galatians, all these passages which all fit together. Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture does not conflict with itself. Important principle, so how does this fit? Number one, because national Israel in the sovereign plan of God was disciplined, and temporarily set aside, God opened the door of salvation to the Gentiles. That's in harmony with this. 
That's Romans chapter 9. Number two, even during the time of chastening, God continued to save out a remnant of believing Jews. That's Romans chapter 10. Three, but God still has a future plan for national Israel in the literal tribulation and millennium because of the promises to Abraham and the Jewish people through Isaac and Jacob. That's Romans 11. And that's what he's talking about here. It's not in conflict with Romans. It's not in conflict with Galatians. It's not in conflict with Colossians, which I read, though we didn't comment too much on it, or 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. It's in harmony with that. Ephesians 2, which we just looked at a moment ago, makes it clear that we as Gentiles have entered into the benefits of the new covenant through the blood of Christ, which was infinite in its scope. That does not make the church Israel. Just like having a second child. Let me give you this as an illustration, because you know I've got a lot of kids. Some of you have kids. I know all of you at one time were kids. Okay. <laughs> That does not make the church Israel, just like having a second child in the family, does not make the second child into the first child. In other words, when I was born, I entered into the benefits of my godly heritage. I was part of the household, the Spencer household. Two and a half years later, my sister was born. She entered into exactly the same benefits of that godly heritage, though there were things that were different for her because she was a girl. Just because she was born into the same household did not make her a boy, and it did not make me into a girl, for which I'm very thankful. You know the Jewish prayer that Orthodox Jewish men pray every morning, the first thing they get up and they say in their prayer is, I thank thee, O Lord, that thou hast not made me a woman. <laughs> Talk about a... Well, anyway. <laughs> that is not a biblical prayer, but that is what many Orthodox Jews pray first thing in the morning. Uh, it did not make me into a girl. For example... My parents bought my dear sister dresses, jewelry, and perfume. But you know something? My parents never bought me dresses or jewelry or perfume. They handed me some deodorant every now and then, but not perfume. <laughs> my parents sent me off to a Christian boarding school where I had to participate in strenuous athletics and sports. My parents kept my sister at home in a much more protected and sheltered environment. We were both 100% part of the same household, but there were things about us that were different. I never became my sister. My sister never became me. So why is it so difficult for replacement theologians to see that both Israel and the church can be part of the same household of God without one becoming the other, or without one usurping all the rights positions, and privileges of the other. I mean, that is a simple illustration. He's just talked about the household of God and how we have become part of the household of God. It's the phrase he uses. But that doesn't mean we became Israel. That doesn't mean that Israel's promises got canceled. It doesn't mean that God suddenly decided to abandon Israel or disinherit Israel or throw them out. When my sister was born, my parents didn't throw me out, for which I'm thankful. <laughs> Neither did God with national Israel. The solution to the imagined problem is simple. Take the biblical text at face value. Israel means Israel, and the church is the church. Both are part of the household of God, but they are different, just like sons are different from daughters. And different sons are different from one another as well. Believe me, not one of my eight sons is the same as any one of his brothers. You know some of them, and you know how absolutely different they all are. Not one of my five daughters is identical to her sisters. But they are all part of the same household. And all have had different blessings, different experiences, different gifts, different talents, different opportunities, different obligations, though some things in each of those categories has been the same. So you will see things that are similar between Israel and the church. But folks, there are differences too. Some radical differences. Just because there are some things that are the same doesn't mean that we are identical or that somehow we have morphed so that God no longer has any promises for Israel as a nation.
There's one other reference to the term Israel by Paul, which is clearly also referring to the Jews. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. That's clearly referring to literal Israel because when Joseph died in Egypt, he told them, you know, you're going to bury me here, but I know God is going to come and he's going to take you out of Egypt and he's going to bring you to the promised land. When you go, I don't want to be left here. Take my bones back. One other miscellaneous passage it should be mentioned of which the term church now this is a real important one because you will find this in in the common argumentation most of the good theologians don't use this argument but when you're talking to someone who hasn't done a whole lot of study on the subject they'll use this argument where the term church is used in the English Bible where the context is clearly the Jews this passage is from Stephen's sermon in Acts 7 just before he gets stoned to death and that wasn't the reason he got stoned to death, uh, because he had bad theology. But uh, this is the passage, Acts chapter 7, verse 36. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and the wilderness 40 years. We're clearly talking about the Jews here. This is that Moses, yes, that historical figure Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, yes, this is real Jews. A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him ye shall hear. And we've studied that in the past, the prophetic passages in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 and verse 18, where Moses prophesies the coming of Christ. Verse 38. This is he, that is Moses, that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai, which is Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, that was the Ten Commandments, that's Mount Sinai, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, but as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. We're clearly in the context of Israel in the wilderness, the real Jewish people in the wilderness. And Stephen used... That phrase, this is he that was in the church, in the church, in the wilderness. But you know something is rather interesting, that passage is not usually cited by replacement theologians to try to prove their point, because most of them know that the underlying Greek text can easily be answered. But enthusiasts who are looking for debate with people who don't know the answer like to jump on that particular passage. Clearly, verse 38 is referring to the Jews as they came out of Egypt. And in English, Stephen says, the church in the wilderness. On the surface, that would imply that Israel was the church. Yes, everybody with me so far? You're with me, I hope. Yeah. Are you asleep yet? Okay, no, I hope not. That would imply that Israel is the church, even before the church is formed in Acts chapter 2. 1,445 years later, I make it more than that, almost 1,500 years, because of course you've got to go through the life of Christ and part way into the book of Acts. So, you see, the enthusiasts, they say, it uses the word church. And that is the same Greek word, and this is true, that is the same Greek word, ecclesia, that is used for the church throughout the rest of the New Testament when Paul writes and say, to the church at Rome, or to the church at Philippi, or to the church at Colossae. He uses ecclesia. It's the same Greek word. In fact, it's the most common word for the local church and for the church universal in the New Testament. So do we throw up our hands in despair? How do we answer? If somebody threw that argument at you, would you know how to answer that argument? In fact, you can answer it from the book of Acts. But would you know how to do it? Let me read you another passage also from Acts. Here's a passage written by the same author. It's in the same book. He uses the same word translated church as in Acts 7. And let me see if you can pick up on the answer. Twelve chapters later. This is Acts chapter 19. I'm going to start reading in verse 23 if you want to follow along. Get your detective skills out. See if you are hermeneutically adept. See if you can see how Acts chapter 19 answers the question that I've just raised in Acts chapter 7. Starting in verse 23. And the same time there arose no small stir about that way. 
For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain to the craftsmen. You say, oh, I know, uh, it was because they had the golden calf, and this is silver, so gold, the old, and silver. No, that has nothing to do with it. Okay. By whom he called together, uh, there's an important phrase, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sir, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone in Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this call hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they are no gods which are made with hands. In other words, this is an economic problem we've got. We've got a guy out there who is boycotting our industry, and he's having an effect, and our sales are down. He didn't care whether or not Diana existed. He cared whether or not there was money in his pocket. Okay. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but uh, to be theologically correct, we must say, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Right, okay, Demetrius, that's fine. You know, cut the, all the garbage. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, said unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. Hey, big crowd, let's go see what's happening, huh? You know, we have no idea why we're here, we just thought something's going on. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, and the Jews putting him forth, and Alexander beckoned with the hand, and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Can you imagine saying the same thing over and over again for two hours? I mean, even the Hindus doing their mantras don't do that. They yell the same phrase for two hours. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, he ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. For you have brought hither these men which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Church robbers. Hmm. Interesting. Were these guys busy worried about Paul and company robbing churches? Move on. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies, let them implead one another. But if you inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. And so, did you see the answer? It's right there. In fact, it occurs three times. You say, oh, I thought I got it right there without churches. I saw churches once. That was in verse 37. Actually, the answer occurs three times in this passage here. It's in verse 32, verse 39, and verse 41. If you want to glance at those quickly. The answer is the word assembly. That word translated assembly there is the same Greek word translated in Acts chapter 7 as the church in the wilderness. It's the word ecclesia. That's clearly not a meeting of the local church. In fact, Demetrius called together in verse 25. It's a compound of the word that's translated called there. That word ecclesia here in Acts chapter 19 is clearly not the local church. It's not the church universal. It's not the church in heaven. So why does Stephen use the term ecclesia in Acts 7, which the translators translated into English as church? And the answer is simple. The term ecclesia is a compound of two Greek words, ek, which means out of, and kaleo, which means to call. In other words, it's a called out group of people. We see that same type of thing in the word exodus. That's a compound of ek, meaning out of, and hodos, which means a road. So exodus means the road out. That's why the book of Exodus gets its name. That's the road out of Egypt. So when Stephen uses the term ecclesia in Acts 7, 
He is specifically referring to the assembly of people that God called out of Egypt. Because an ecclesia is a called out assembly. We're so used to using the term church in relation to a group of believers who've gathered together in a certain location that we don't realize that that is a general term which came to us in very specific meaning. Stephen uses the term ecclesia because he's specifically referring to the people of God called out of Egypt. It's an ecclesia and called out assembly. That's why it's also appropriate to use the term by the same author, Luke, in Acts 19, for the called out assembly of pagans intent on rioting against Christians. The pagan assembly was clearly not the church, just like the called out assembly of Israel was not the church in the New Testament sense. Using Acts 7 to try to prove that Israel is the church is a disingenuous argument, and for someone who knows better, it is a dishonest argument. Even reputable theologians who are replacement theologians who intensely want to prove that Israel is the church do not use that argument. Israel and the rest of the New Testament, quickly, in two minutes or less, Lord willing. Do you believe me? The term Israel is not found in James. The term Israel is not found in 1 Peter. The term Israel is not found in 2 Peter. The term Israel is not found in 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John. The term Israel is not found in Jude. The term Israel is found three times in the book of Revelation, where it is clearly still national Israel, and that is in the future. Revelation 2.14 but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast taught them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and commit fornication. Balaam and Balak all related to national Israel. Israel in the wilderness wanderings, Israel got judged because they did this. Revelation 7, 4, And I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And you know the list of tribes is given. And then chapter 21, 12, and had a great and high wall, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. That's clearly talking about the twelve tribes of Israel in the Old Testament. Those are not some kind of hypothetical names that someday God will reveal what they are. It's the twelve tribes of Israel. We see this still in the future. God still has promises for Israel. To answer the question then that we raised at the beginning, the Jews is God's people. Is the church Israel or is Israel the church? The answer is no. Both are part of the household of God, but the church has not replaced national Israel to whom various immutable, unconditional covenants have been given. There is still a special future for Israel as a nation under the promises of God. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you that we've had opportunity to look at every one of these passages that deal with the term Israel and what you say about it. And we thank you that you are a God who keeps his covenants. As you have kept your immutable covenants with Israel, so you will keep your immutable covenants with us. Because you have not cast away your people of the Old Testament, it means that you will also not cast us away. You are the God upon whom we can depend, the God upon whom we do indeed rely, the God who has given to us great and precious promises concerning eternal life. And you've given us a relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we might respond to him in love. Not because we're under the law, but because by your Spirit we are empowered to obey him, to serve him, to love him, for he is our loving God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for this morning, excuse me, yes, is number 413. All that preaching and I forgot we have a communion service here. We will sing, uh, we'll stand and sing verses 1 and 4 of Break Thou the Bread of Life and then we'll have the Lord's Table. Let's stand and sing. Break the bread of life, dear to me, as thou didst break the bread beside the sea, be on the sacred page, I safely 
join together and say the Apostles' Creed. It's in your bulletin beginning on the bottom of the first page and going up to the top of the second. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, explains to them what he received by special revelation since he was not there the night in which our Lord was betrayed. And he tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Beginning in verse 23, Paul writes, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. As Paul gives his instructions to the church at Corinth, he sets forth some very important principles. Number one, this is the Lord's table. It belongs to him and not to a denomination or a church. It is his table. Number two, he has commanded, not merely requested, but he has commanded us as believers to take and eat. Number three, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are strongly warned in this passage not to partake because there is no magic in the elements. This is not what saves you. This is not what sanctifies you. This is a memorial. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. But the most serious warning in the passage is to Christians. Those who are walking in the flesh, those who are being disobedient to the Word of God, those who are involved in sin and they don't want to give it up. They want to come to the Lord's table with dirty hands, with having, without having been washed by the washing of the water of the Word, without having confessed their sins and being cleansed by the blood of Christ. And some of them at Corinth, coming to the Lord's table that way, actually got sick and some of them died. God is very serious about the memorials that he gives to us, about the signs and the symbols that he set forth in his word that we might manifest to the world around us what it is like to be part of the body of Christ. This morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we encourage you not to participate. But we also warn those who are saved, if you participate, be sure that you come with clean hands and a clean heart. And so before we partake of the Lord's table, we're going to bow our heads for a moment of silent prayer that each one of us might confess the sins that are in our lives, that we might be washed and cleansed as God promises 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that as we come to your table this day, confessing our sins, that the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, cleanses us from all sin. In this very serious moment, we are having fellowship not only with one another, but with you and with your Son, Jesus Christ. Your word says so. We do this as we remember what he did for us, how he paid for our sins on Calvary's cross. All the wickedness, the heinous wickedness in your sight that has penetrated our lives, has corrupted us in every part, and yet is washed clean by the blood of Jesus and repaired and restored as the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and applies it to our hearts. Father, we pray for your blessing on this time of fellowship together, that Jesus Christ through it might be glorified, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed, and went out and hanged himself. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they did cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Gracious Father, how we thank you for this bread which portrays for us the shed, the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ, in which he bore our sins on Calvary's cross, that we being dead unto sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. We thank you, Father, that he took our place, that he died in our stead, that he bore all of our sins, not just some of them. Father, we thank you for Jesus, the one who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood.
This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. From the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let's see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Father, again we thank you for the cup. What a beautiful symbol of the precious shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's tree. How we thank you that Jesus took our sins, he bore them in our place. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no sending away of sin. And yet, because Jesus died in our place, the sinless Lamb of God, because he shed his blood, all of our sins are indeed forgiven. Father, we thank you for this cup. And as we partake of the cup together, and have fellowship with you and with your Son, Jesus Christ, and with one another, we remember him who gave himself for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Father. You are a gracious and wonderful God, a, a marvelous giver. You have given us your best. Father, we pray that you might teach us to give you our best. And how we thank you that this table of which we have just partaken not only looks back 2,000 years to a blood-stained hillside in Jerusalem, it looks forward to the glorious second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your word declares that every man that has this hope in him, that is the blessed hope, looking forward to the return of Christ, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And so, Father, as we go from this place, give us a renewed zeal for living pure lives, lives of holiness, lives of godliness, lives of faithfulness, lives of service, Lives that are focused not on the things of earth, but lives that are focused on the things of eternity, so that we will not be ashamed when our Lord calls us home. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says, When they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of